our February TMIT National Research Testbed High Performer Webinar. Uh, the topic is an old problem, a new focus, anticoagulation, uh, adverse drug events. We're addressing the big three uh, adverse drug events, which we'll get into, and this is part one of that series. I'm uh, uh, Charles Denham, Chairman of TMIT, and I'm on slide two, and we'll advance quickly so we can get to our great speakers. On slide three, we just want to drive you to uh, a icon to ask for a separate phone line if your audio is not delivering for you. But make sure that your computer is turned up in terms of uh, highest volume settings that you can have before you do so. On slide four, you'll see safetyleaders.org, which is uh, uh, the home website for the research testbed. And in the upper right-hand corner of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this website, if you're not on yet in terms of uh, getting your slides or downloading the slides, if you click the, on the webinar, you'll come to what I have in slide four for those of you that are viewing it. And, that, and this also will be where you can come back and listen to the webinar again and watch the slides and access other resources that are great speakers. Uh, uh, Dr. Jacobson and uh, Nadine Shehab will, uh, uh, can uh, direct us to. On slide six, the social media uh, uh, linkages uh, uh, are before you. On slide seven is our TMIT purpose. And this, uh, this uh, webinar really meets the me our measure of success, which is uh, to focus on how we might be able to protect and enrich the lives of families, of patients, and caregivers. And our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities that we serve. I won't go through the disclosure statement, but it is up to date, and it's on slide eight with our uh, speakers. However, no product or service uh, represented uh, uh, by us in any way will be uh, presented, uh, and you can see that on uh, slide nine. And TMIT is not involved in uh, with anyone in terms of anticoagulation management or uh, products or services at this point in time, uh, and wanted to address that. Our speakers and reactors: we have Dr. Alan Jacobson from Loma Linda uh, VA uh, Medical Center, Nadine Shehab from the CDC, uh, Dan Ford, one of our frequent speakers. Uh, representing the voice of the patient, Frank Guiato, our Chief Technology Officer, and also had developed expertise uh, that uh, we both had learned, myself and Frank, from Dr. Jacobson a decade ago in anticoagulation management. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But we want to start off with the voice of the patient. And as many of you know, Dan Ford is a tireless champion as a patient advocate. He's the recently retired Vice President of First Group, uh, is dedicated to a number of uh, organizations and spends time speaking on patient safety and has been a champion of a number of really great uh, programs. He's worked with the NQF and worked with a number of organizations, has been a co-author on multiple papers uh, with us and others. And we'd like to have Dan just set the stage for us with a quick 30-second, 45-second sort of commentary. And then Dan will also be a reactor uh, as part of our reactor panel. Dan? Uh, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it, and thank you for uh, involving me. Um, I'd like to welcome all the participants, uh, as well as our outstanding speakers. Um, and I, I commend you, Chuck, on your continued series of, of webinar subjects that are important to patient safety and quality, uh, and, and each of which uh, webinar typically has outstanding speakers. Subject today, it's my understanding or my perception that this has been under the radar important as it is, and a lot of people dealing with it, but as, as compared with some of the other uh, issues and subjects in, uh, in, the, in the whole medical era uh, arena, uh, this one is getting some needed attention now. And so I'm looking forward to hearing more about it, and I'll pass it back to you, Chuck. Thank you. Great, Dan. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for being on as uh, also a reactor. So the title that we picked was Old Problems, New Focus. And as I mentioned, this area of anticoagulation management, ADEs, the underuse of anticoagulants, and then the proper use of them was something that was just an eye-opener for uh, our team uh, at TMIT uh, now more than a decade ago. And it really does demand innovation. And so uh, just to set up our two speakers, uh, uh, 
today. Uh, I just wanted to address this National Action Plan for ADEs, which uh, Nadine will get into in much more detail uh, and, and address. But it became, we became aware of it and realized that the, these three ADEs, adverse drug events, cause an enormous problem, and an interagency task force had been working on it and put out a terrific report and some really important numbers. And that's what prompted us to, to put together this three-part series, first with anticoagulation management, then with opioids, and then with diabetic agents. But you can see on this slide the impact of ADEs, and I've shown this in our last webinar, so there may be new viewers, and I just wanted to remind ourselves the enormous uh, cost in terms of suffering uh, and harm as well as dollars that are generated by these 1.9 million uh, stays. It's the most common post-discharge complication, 3.5 million office visits, um, uh, a million emergency department visits. This slide is uh, a slide of the, a fishbone diagram of the complex system at play. I won't go through it, but I want it to be in your slide deck so you can go back and look at it and address these different causes and different issues at play uh, with all three of these adverse events. And then a slide from the plan uh, coning in on the topics that have been selected by uh, the government to really focus on because of how common they were, how significant they were, and how preventable. So to this, this, uh, this month, we'll cover anticoagulants. And we're going to ask you in a poll afterwards if you need a deeper dive. Uh, we're guessing a lot of our audience really does on protocols. Uh, second is uh, we will uh, next month do opioids. And the third month, uh, we will do uh, insulin and oral uh, diabetics, just a little bit out of order because of our speaker availability. And this slide really de describes what I would describe, or some of us would describe, the triple threat of these three ADEs. They represent over 30% of all of them, these categories of warfarin, uh, insulins, uh, and oral diabetic agents uh, represent 30%. Now, that's not even including the opioids. And as we will learn from Dr. Jacob, and the new anticoagulation medicines are important as well. Finally, I just wanted to give you a report back from our anonymous polling last month. We asked the question, I am interested in training and help to reduce anticoagulation-related adverse drug events. A whopping 56% of you gave it a 10. That gets our attention, so when we poll later, please don't be conservative if you're 100% behind what some of the questions we're asking. This was a wake-up call. 56%, 10 8%, 9 But there was a spread of others that may not be as interested in anti-coag, but this is a very, very commanding net promoter score if you subtract the 1s through 6s from the 9s and 10s. We ask about the same question about diabetic agent-related ADEs, and it's still very high. 42% of you gave it a 10 that you want help and training to reduce these, 13% a 9, and then you see the spread of the rest. A little bit less, uh, but still an enormous number of you really want more of a deep dive on this. And then finally, the opioid uh, use-related uh, uh, ADEs. Again, 41% 10s, 12% 9s, and you see the spread, a little bit more of a spread on this group. And in our next webinar, I'll cover some of the other questions because uh, I, I don't want to uh, take time away from our speakers. The, the end question was, I want to know how to work with community pharmacists to reduce ADEs. We thought this was an enormous number at 35% because many of you don't have responsibilities for popu larger populations. And one of our questions asked that, and we got a pretty big answer there. So even though this is 35% tens, it's still an enormous number. And we are going to, going to commit to have programs going forward to help link community pharmacists and really the team from the ecosystem. We asked the question, how many of you are increasingly responsible for larger populations? No big surprise. Many of you are now having to uh, and inherited a number of outpatient issues and these three, uh, these three adverse uh, drug events uh, really are across the continuum of care. Uh, my final slide is really to remind ourselves that as we move from uh, the volume-driven incentive model where we are incentivized to, uh, for as many visits and procedures as we do to the value-driven competitive value contracting, all of a sudden these adverse events, we move from getting paid for treating them 
to actually being responsible for treating them and preventing them. And it's an entirely different model where now there will be embedded financial incentives over time to, to minimize the strokes, the bleeds, the anticoagulation events that occur. And so with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Ellen Jacobson, who we have just had the incredible honor of learning from, a wonderful teacher. Frank and I have known him for over a decade, and we worked together with him on design of a systematic approach to anticoagulation management. And this prompted our title of an old problem in that this was a major problem back then, but the new focus that we are grateful to the federal government for really uh, addressing is, uh, is, uh, makes it the new focus. And Dr. Jacobson is a staff cardiologist and associate chief of staff for research at Loma Linda VA Medical Center here where I am in Southern California. He's a native of Canada. He's been at Loma Linda uh, uh, since 1977 where he attended medical school. In addition to practicing general cardiology, he has a very special interest in anticoagulation and antithrombotic therapy. And we sought out the top leaders in the country a decade ago to focus on a testing, uh, on, uh, testing device and had to learn end-to-end -end this anticoagulation area. And he has been an enormous contributor to that nationally, but also really helped us understand this a new area for us uh, and published with him. He's been the medical director of the cardiology anticoagulation clinic since 1990 and also been active in standardization of laboratory tests for PT determinations and uh, has a much longer uh, history History of great work and uh, bio, I, I re recommend that you look him up. But uh, uh, Alan, I don't, I can't think of anybody who'd be a better teacher and to get us uh, back engaged in this than you. So we'll hand it over to you now. Thanks. Well, it's a, a privilege to be here, and uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I can think of a fair number of other individuals. It's interesting that you have two federally employed presenters today, um, and I do need to comment at least uh, briefly on my disclosures. I do work for the Department of Veterans Affairs, but I'm presenting in my professional capacity today, not representing the Department of Veter Veteran Affairs. And in some ways, I'm probably the most conflicted presenter you'll get because I will work with anybody in the anticoagulant arena. Um, much of this, my own philosophy is if we don't work with industry to try to help them be responsible in how they present their products, um, then it, it's harder to criticize things and letting them know both what the patient perspective needs to be. So personally, even though I work for the U.S. government, I do work with pretty much all of the industry individuals who either make pharmaceutical agents for anticoagulation or who make devices for, for monitoring those agents. Um, like I say, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, there are numerous other non-federal presenters who could give equally an informed presentation. Uh, Jack Ansell, Ann Witkowski, Dave Garcia, Lynn Artell, Scott Cates are all individuals who in a variety of practice settings um, I interact with frequently and learn from frequently and it's a lot of um, interactive back and forth as we compare our different healthcare systems. As Chuck mentioned, we're in an era of transition and it will be interesting to see how the quote, private sector begins to respond as we move from fee-for-service to accountable care organizations. One of the reasons that groups such as the Department of Veterans Affairs and even some of the Kaiser healthcare systems have been quite involved in this area is because we currently do pay for the complications. If one of my atrial fibrillation patients has a stroke, we end up paying for their nursing home. And that's not a theoretical per patient cost, it's an actual check out the door payment to a facility on a month by month basis. So we can very accurately calculate the impact even at the local facility level related to some of these things. Um, so what we're going to go through, uh, just to give you a, a quick idea as to the outline. Um, for those of you who haven't looked at this arena too much, we'll give a little bit of the clinical background, um, and we'll focus mostly on atrial fibrillation, um, even though we also use 
anticoagulation and warfarin in particular for mechanical heart valves, uh, as well as patients for deep vein thrombosis. Um, atrial fibrillation is the area where the, the risk-benefit issues are the clearest. Um, I'll briefly mention the Health and Human Services Adverse Drug Event Initiative. Um, I'm very, very happy to have Nadine here to be able to present the detail on that. And understanding that many of you are involved in quality assurance, quality improvement types of initiatives. We'll look at some of the ways that people try to utilize metrics, what the strengths of some of those metrics are, um, what the weaknesses are of some metrics that may be easy to get but may not be as useful as we would like. And then we'll look briefly at are the new drugs the answer? Unless you live in a cave and never watch television, you'll realize there's a lot of new blood thinners out there. Um, but that also brings up, if you also watch television at all, I'm sure you've seen things saying, have you or a loved one taken a blood thinner? Have you had a bleed? Call us. We will sue for you. And so the whole issue of adverse drug events with the new agents is very much front and center. And then the area that I am most passionate about is what is the role of patient education in all of this? So. Moving into the whole issue of atrial fibrillation and how this gets us into trouble or gets patients with atrial fibrillation into trouble, um, those of you who've had any cardiac anatomy, um, in atrial fibrillation what basically happens is the upper chamber of the heart, what we call the left atrium, loses its normal regular contractility. It just kind of sits there and shudders at three to 500 flutters or fib fibrillations a minute. And that increased the possibility of a clot forming within that chamber. As you can see at the bottom of this slide, all you need is a four millimeter clot, and that's pretty small, a four millimeter clot, less than a quarter of an inch, to break loose, go into the left ventricle, on out the aorta, and on up to the brain. And a four millimeter clot is enough to wipe out a middle cerebral artery and take a patient who is totally normal one minute and leave them completely debilitated a few minutes later with a very narrow window to be able to intervene. And unfortunately, on most patients, their ability to get access to care within that window, um, and especially if they haven't been educated on the need to do that. Now, within this, as we're going to come to, the goal of my presentation is not to say how do we eliminate adverse drug events, it's how do we minimize adverse drug events. There will always be a cost in bleeding to using blood thinners such as warfarin and the new anticoagulants. And part of the patient education and what we do for every patient who goes on a blood thinner in our building is we have a discussion on the differences in body cells, the brain cells are the most crucial and the most specialized. And we're willing to recommend paying a fairly high price to preserve brain cells. Because when they're damaged, we have exceedingly limited capability for other brain cells to take over the function and we obviously have no way to replace brain cells. Second is heart cells. Now, if you damage one part of the heart, other parts can somewhat take over, but you damage enough cells in the heart, we have no alternatives. And so if a patient needs an antiplatelet drug to preserve heart cells along with an anticoagulant drug to prevent atrial fibrillation associated clots and resulting strokes, we may be willing to accept and recommend a higher bleeding risk to be able to preserve heart cells and brain cells. And that even though we don't like bleeding, in most major bleeds, we can treat the patient. We can transfuse blood cells. And it's amazing when patients understand that hierarchy. And we make sure that we tell patients going on blood thinners, these will interfere with your ability to make blood clots. It will increase your risk of bleeding. It will increase your chance of needing a blood transfusion. And there is a chance that this may cause fatal or deadly bleeding. However, here are the numbers, and we'll go through what the risks are between those. And it's amazing the number of patients who will say, Doc, I don't care if I need a blood transfusion once a year. Don't let me have a stroke. 
But if we've never had that discussion with the patient, it's very hard for the patient to accept the adverse drug event when it happens if they don't even know why they were taking the medication in the first place. So the underlying issue, when patients go into this irregular heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, it disrupts the flow in the left atrium of the heart, increases the risk for clots to form, and a very, very small clot can have devastating consequences for the patient. The other thing we want to make sure our patients understand is that not all strokes are the same. Most patients that have strokes in the United States have them because of hardening of the arteries in the brain, what we call cerebrovascular stroke. In that case, what happens is one of the blood vessels in the brain becomes diseased, blocks off, and the part of the brain that that feeds dies. Atrial fibrillation associated strokes are different. This is where a piece of a blood clot breaks away from the left atrium as we just saw and can go up to the brain and block a vessel. In a number of studies that have been done, including the one shown here, in this case they looked at 1,000 patients coming in with a stroke. 20% of those patients had atrial fibrillation associated with their stroke. And if you look to see who end up being permanently disabled and bedridden, the chance of a patient with atrial fibrillation being permanently bedridden was almost double what it was for a patient without atrial fibrillation. So patients who have strokes due to hardening of the arteries, a 20 to 25% chance that if they have a stroke, they will be permanently disabled. An atrial fibrillation patient it's not just that they have an increased risk of stroke. If they have a stroke, they're almost twice as likely to be permanently disabled. And the way I explain that to my patients is it basically means you're not going to be able to feed yourself or take care of your own hygiene anymore. And for many patients, losing that kind of freedom is a huge issue. Now, the third type of stroke that we need to be aware of are strokes due to bleeding into the brain. And especially for patients on blood thinners, it is the same anticoagulant that we use to prevent the stroke and prevent the blood clot from forming in the left atrium that then increases the chance that if the patient falls and hits their head, they may bleed into the brain. And so one of the things we'll look at is what are the chances of these drugs causing bleeds into the brain. Um, in that case, you bleed into the brain, there's almost a 50% chance you will die from it and if you survive it, it's roughly a 60% chance you'll be permanently disabled. So even though we want to prevent the strokes, we want to minimize the number of bleeds into the brain that we end up causing as a result of our therapy. The original studies that were done back in the mid to late 1980s, um, five initial trials that compared warfarin against placebo, on this slide, the green bars represent the stroke rates for the patients on placebo. The red bars represent the stroke rates for the patients on warfarin. If you mix these different trials together, the rough numbers come out that the average older patient has a stroke risk of about 1% per year. If they go into atrial fibrillation, it goes to 5% per year. And if you anticoagulate them, you take it back down close to the 1% per year, probably around 1.4, somewhere around there. Depends a little bit on which study you look at. Um, again, you don't eliminate the risk of stroke because these patients may still have strokes due to other causes. But you can pretty much eliminate the burden of stroke associated or the increased burden associated with the atrial fibrillation. But... Warfarin is a challenging drug to use. You look at many of our therapies, even with aspirin. If you take 80 milligrams of aspirin, 160, 325. Not huge differences in the outcomes between those. Even though going from 81 to 325 is almost a 400% dosing window. With warfarin, if five milligrams a day is the right dose for a patient, Four milligrams is too little, and six milligrams is too much. Four milligrams a day will leave them at risk for stroke. Six milligrams a day will increase their risk for bleeding. And yet, what is the right dose for a particular patient? 
Most patients are on somewhere between 1 to 10 milligrams a day. Most clinics have a range of somewhere between a half a milligram per day up to 15, maybe 20 milligrams a day. The highest we've had is one patient on 120 milligrams a day. So you can't just say, oh, here's the right dose. For a given patient, you somewhat make a guess at the dose. We often simply start with 5 milligrams a day, and we start doing lab testing to then see, is 5 the right dose? Do we need to go a little bit higher or a little bit lower? The difficulty is, once we find out what the right dose is for a patient, that may or may not stay the right dose for the patient. Some patients stay on that dose for several years. Other patients, due to changes in medicine, changes in diet, changes in liver function, end up needing to be on a different dose three or four times a year. And it may, may vary dramatically. You go on a medicine called amiodarone, and it will dramatically reduce your need for warfarin. And if you don't reduce it, it's going to amplify the effect and increase the risk for bleeding. So challenges with figuring out the right dosing, uh, ensuring that the patient has things right, understands how to minimize changes. Most patients, we aim for a lab value of an INR between 2 and 3. Some valve patients have higher targets. So you can't always look a patient with an INR of 3.2. For a valve patient, that might be in the desired range. For an atrial fibrillation patient, that may be higher than where you want them. So the monitoring and management, the interpretation of the lab tests can be a challenge. This next slide is simply to show that if you keep the INR above 2, you prevent blood clots. As soon as you start dropping below 2, the risk for blood clots and specifically stroke begins to rise dramatically. Then if you start getting too much warfarin, and in this slide it's relating to heart valves, you start getting above the 4 to 5 range and the risk for bleeding begins to go up dramatically, including the risk for bleeding into the brain. So we have this window that we need to try and keep the patients in where we can have an optimal balance between safety and effectiveness. And yet the challenge is if you keep all of your patients in this window all of the time, you're still going to have large numbers of adverse drug events because the bottom line is rarely do patients bleed because of their blood thinner. They bleed because of some other medical problem. They bleed from their ulcer. They bleed from their colon polyps. They bleed from their diverticular disease, their colon cancer. They bleed because they fall and had trauma. The difference is once you're on an anticoagulant like warfarin, instead of bleeding three units of blood from your diverticular disease, you may bleed 12 units of blood. So the biggest issue with anticoagulants is no matter how carefully you manage the patients on warfarin and keep them in the desired range, the rate of bleeding when it's minimized is still going to be higher than patients not on blood thinners because otherwise minor bleeds may well become major bleeds. So just to give some perspective that our long-term goal is not to eliminate all bleeds but to minimize the number of bleeds and to optimize the chance that the patients understand it. Now, an article that has really raised the awareness of this, and it's been interesting to watch, this is, and Nadine may be able to give a better idea, I think this is at least the third publication um, that Dr. Budnitz, and again, you'll notice that our, our next presenter is uh, one of the authors on this paper, um, and it's been very interesting to watch because every three to four years as they would publish, it would be one level of journal higher. Now, I'm not sure where they're planning to publish next because this last one was New England Journal of Medicine, um, but each time it's been more focused, they've had more data behind it, and it's gathered more attention. But looking at, with older patients in particular, what adverse drug events get them to the hospital, emergency room, and then result in admission to the hospital? And Dr. Denham alluded to this slide earlier. Table 4 out of this article, in many ways for me, is the most useful. You end up looking at warfarin. Out of 
100,000 hospitalizations for ADEs, 33,000 of those related to warfarin, 33% roughly of those admissions. Insulins, a distant second, roughly 14%, roughly half the number. Oral antiplatelets, another class of blood thinners, then comes in third. So you get two categories of blood thinners, warfarin and oral antiplatelets. That's almost half of the adverse drug events that get patients admitted to the hospital, older patients. You then get insulin and other diabetic oral agents, and that's another 25%. So between blood thinners and diabetes care, that's almost 75% of the hospitalizations for adverse drug events. And as you can see from the National Action Plan, then opioids are the next group that comes in here. So looking at this grouping, notice even if you cut the number of admissions from warfarin by 50%, it would still be the number one implicated medication or category. So just to give some perspective as we look at some of the new drugs down the road. Dr. Denham has already mentioned the National Action Plan for Adverse Drug Events. Um, I'm very impressed with Health and Human Services uh, taking on this initiative. Uh, CDC has obviously been very, very intimately involved with this, but along with, with other, fed, other federal agencies, as you're all well aware by now, the three targets are anticoagulants, focusing on bleeding, diabetes agents, focusing on hypoglycemia, and on opioids, um, trying to prevent the accidental um, excess effects. So with warfarin, complicated therapy, and partly as a result of the complications of therapy and the complexity of therapy, physicians want life streamlined and simplified. They don't want to have to take on, and in many cases, simply don't have the resources or time to take on complex management. And if it's then going to be complicated by bleeding, it's a whole lot easier to say, why don't you just take an aspirin a day? Now, the fact that aspirin probably has almost zero impact on atrial fibrillation-associated stroke may help reduce the incidence of cerebrovascular stroke is often then ignored. Doctors will look for a reason to avoid anticoagulation so they don't have to educate, manage, and follow the patient. And especially if there is any perception that the patient is at increased risk for bleeding, no matter how high the actual stroke risk may be, some very interesting vignettes done where physicians would be presented two patients both very high risk for stroke. One would have no bleeding risks that anticoagulate that patient. The next patient, if they had any minor indication for bleeding, wouldn't anticoagulate. So when we look at the United States currently, almost half of the patients who do not have contraindications still don't receive therapy. So if you look at the total population of atrial fibrillation patients and our ability to prevent stroke in those patients, the majority of the patients in the United States are not receiving it. So what do QI people get to do? How does some of this relate? Um, you know, a very simple quality question I'll often ask when I'm presenting to physician practice groups is, can you identify which of your patients are late for their INR? And I get these funny looks. Oh, I do a great job, and my patients, well, yeah, I don't do a perfect job, but they're all doing wonderful. Um, the reality is, unless somebody can show you how you're doing that, um, it was roughly around 1995 um, that in my own clinic, we finally put in a computerized system for following the patients. And prior to that, we would have said the same thing. We do a great job. Uh, you know, we have computerized records. We're able to, you know, get in touch with our patients. We can look up their labs. But when we put in a specific computer system, we found out that out of, at that time, a little bit over 1,200 patients on warfarin, we had up to 200 patients 
who were more than a month late for an INR test, some of whom were out to 12 months late. So until you actually do the QI evaluation and look at the numbers, you have no idea. This is a diagram that um, was put together a number of years ago, um, working with Chuck Denham and Frank Guiteau a number of years back. Um, a group of us had gotten together to say, what are the core essential elements of following up a patient on warfarin? And Dr. Jack Ansell was very much involved with this and helped come up with this actual kind of flow that you need to have an educated patient who you then start on a medication, schedule them for a follow-up lab test, get the test done, decide what to do with the result, and when you need to see the patient back again. And this is an ongoing iterative process. You need ongoing education of the patients. You need ongoing quality improvement, quality assurance that your system is working the way it is, should be, that you have qualified healthcare providers. Part of what we meant by this word active in here was that a missed test result would be as likely to generate a response as an abnormal test result. Because when you would look at this type of system, what we saw was that the two biggest places that people were getting into trouble, quality-wise, was either patients didn't understand what was going on, so if the patient doesn't understand, it's amazing how innovative patients can be at getting out of appointments. We see patients in clinic, it's, well, I can't, I'll, I'll call you back tomorrow to make the appointment. My wife's not here, she keeps the calendar. Patients are incredibly innovative at getting out of appointments. And especially if they don't understand that I need this appointment so I don't get too much drug and bleed or too little drug and have a stroke, and I don't want a stroke, so I'm gonna be invested in my care. The other you'll notice at the bottom here, we have enabling technologies. What that's intended to convey is that these are the elements of a high quality anticoagulation management system. But there are technologies such as computerized anticoagulation clinic software, point of care testing, dosing adjustment algorithms, patient home testing, patient self-testing, all kinds of other options and technologies that allow us both to run a higher quality organization as well as provide options for our patients. So for my own facility, we serve a huge geographic area. I have patients who live up to 400 miles away. Those patients, I can give them a device that they can do all their INR testing at home. They call us on the telephone. We interact with them on the result, schedule them for the next appointment within the computer. And for us, Fridays are our checking day. Every Friday, the staff goes into the computer. Who's late for an appointment? Let's give them a call. What happened to them? Where are they? To ensure that we keep the patients ongoing and keep up the surveillance on the patients. So what are some of the measures that one can look at that are actual QI measures or metrics? Uh, and three of them we'll look at, at least briefly, frequency of testing, percent of values and range, and the time in therapeutic range. Frequency of testing is the simplest. And this was driven home through some discussions with what used to be called CMS um, or Medicare, and in discussions with them as to how to address this issue. One of their comments, they said, we know we have problems. We know that our patients aren't managed well. We don't know how to fund anticoagulation clinics within our legal structure and our payment structure, but we know we have troubles because the average Medicare patient on warfarin is getting less than three INRs a year. Well, if most patients are being tested somewhere between two to six weeks, and the recommendation is on average about once a month, if you have all these patients getting tested 12 times a year, but the average ends up being only 2.8, how many patients are only getting an annual INR? How do you have any idea what their quality is? So the simplest is, do you even know how many INRs a year a patient's getting? I mean, it's a very crude measure, 
but it's very simple to obtain. Uh, it's limited because it doesn't really have any measure of effectiveness or safety. All it says is you at least got a test. It doesn't say whether it was in the desired range or not or the type of result you would want. So one of the alternatives is people then say, okay, we got 12 INRs this year. How many of them were in the desired range? That should be a, a marvelous measure. We, got, we can determine if we got the right number of tests and if they're in the right range or not. And again, it's simple to acquire. You just count it, and for each value, is it in range or not? So if you did 10 INRs last year and nine of them were in range, you'd say 90% of my values are in target range. I must be doing good. But there's a lot of potential biases within this measure, much of which is related to how often you test. And in some sites, we tend to over-test or increase the frequency of testing whenever a patient goes out of range. Other sites don't do that. Sometimes it's because they just don't have the capacity to handle the extra workload. So this is just an example. If you're at a site, if the red line is what happens to a patient during a, a month, say this is a patient who ended up um, getting an upper respiratory infection, got started on an antibiotic around here, it interfered with their INR control and elevated their INR, and then when the antibiotics stopped, it eventually came back down again. Um, if this patient was seen in a clinic that said, okay, we tested you at the start of the month, you called us to say you st were started on an antibiotic, we just said, well, you have an appointment in three weeks, come check your INR then. You check them twice, 30 days apart. They're both between two and three. So you have 100% of your values in the therapeutic range. This group, the patient called and said, I'm on antibiotic. They said, well, come on in. Let's check your INR and see how you're doing. They said, oh, your INR is going up, but it's not too high. Let's check you again in a week and four or five days. Oh, it's still going up. Okay, we're going to check you again in another few days. If it's still going up, we're going to change your orphan dose. Sure enough, it was still going up. They changed the dose. Said, okay, we'll see you back in a few days and see if it's coming down. Yeah, it's coming back down, but it's still elevated, so we'll check you again in another five days. Check them again. Say, okay, you're close to normal. Let's change your warfarin dose back to what your baseline is, and the patient stabilizes. But because of these extra tests to see how the patient is doing in between, they only have 43% of the values in range. Which clinic is doing a better job? So one of the challenges with percent values in range is it's very hard. There are no national or international standards as to what is an appropriate target. And it's very hard to compare institutions and it's very hard to do benchmarking, and that's much of what you try and do in QI is come up with benchmarking. If there is a standard metric, it ends up being time and therapeutic range. Uh, this is a mathematical linear interpolation method. Many places don't use it because it requires a more complex calculation. And unless you're using some kind of computer software in your anechoic clinic, it may be hard to get. Many of you are at larger facilities. And again, one of the things you may want to ask in your COAG clinic is, do you have computerized software? Is it able to report out the time and therapeutic range? I would suggest if it's not able to, you may well want to look at a different type. In terms of what is high quality, most people will say if you're running consistently above 65 percent, you're probably doing pretty good. There's one clinic in Texas that claims that their average is running above 80%. We often see the Scandinavian countries running above 70%. Most U.S. clinics are down in the mid-50s. So many of us have more to do, but this is used within the international literature. It's often used for benchmarking, and time and therapeutic range is what the FDA then uses to determine how well um, drug trials are being conducted because the if you want to make a new drug look good, do a bad job of measuring your warfarin. So the FDA says we want to see a good time and therapeutic range um, in these trials to make sure that you're having a very good comparator. I'm not going to go through this next article. It's here more as a reference. If you want more information on at least one approach, this is Adam Rose, who's the VA out of Boston area. Um, has gone through and really looked at high and low performing clinics and how to distinguish some of those. So uh, that's in there more just for your reference.
This term SOAC, target specific oral anticoagulants, these are the new drugs that you're seeing on television advertising at the moment. Um, you may also hear them talked of as NOACs, novel oral anticoagulants, but it's going on five years that these have now been available. The biggest issue with these drugs is that they have a predictable anticoagulant effect and fixed dosing. So most of the time, for most of the patients, there's one, maybe two doses that are available. Sometimes it depends on kidney function. And so they will either be on 5 milligrams twice a day or 10 milligrams twice a day, depending on their kidneys. No lab monitoring needed. Sounds marvelous. You should have 100% time in therapeutic range all the time. In these trials, this is just one example. In the RELY trial, which was dabigatran versus warfarin, the warfarin group was 64% time in therapeutic range, better than what we usually do. The Scandinavian sites were well over 70% in this trial. Uh, the U.S. sites were in the low 60s. Um, but just an example of what the FDA was requiring for the warfarin control in these, in these studies. And sure enough, this is one of the new drugs, the Bigatran, lower total stroke rate, slightly lower ischemic stroke, dramatically lower hemorrhagic stroke. So in effectiveness, it was better at preventing atrial fibrillation-associated stroke and safer in that it didn't cause, it only caused a third, almost a 70% reduction in bleeding into brain tissue causing strokes. So in that sense, significantly safer. But when you look at total bleeding, major bleeding, warfarin, the new drug. And yet it's amazing, even in 2015, five years after drug release, the number of physicians who still say to me, oh yes, that's one of those new drugs, you don't do any monitoring because patients don't bleed. They obviously never looked at the literature. The major bleed rate, so if warfarin is responsible for 30% of ER admissions from ADEs, how close is the Bigatran going to be? If we moved everybody to the Bigatran, would we eliminate the ADEs? Obviously not. As we look through at the other, rivaroxaban. Major bleed rate, rivaroxaban. Major bleed rate, warfarin. Slightly higher. Less intracranial bleeding. Apixaban. We actually saw a reduction in major bleeding but by 30%. And again, it's hard to run these across trials. Even if we reduced all major bleeds, ADEs, by 30%, it would still be the number one cause of ER ADEs. Coming back to patient education, one of my colleagues in the past have talked about preventive medicine in general, including trying to prevent strokes. Patients will never be aware of nor able to identify the stroke that was prevented, but they'll be too aware of any complications. And as a result of that, if patients don't really understand why they're on therapy, they're not going to know how to take care of themselves or they will not stay on therapy. No patient feels better. They don't feel younger. They don't feel more energetic. They don't feel better in any way, shape, or form being on an anticoagulant. So the only reason to stay on is because they truly understand what's going on. A very nice study done looking at 125,000 patients, 10% didn't fill their second prescription, 30% stopped their warfarin within the first year, 43% within the first two years. How long do we need to anticoagulate atrial fibrillation patients? Well, it's a 65-year-old, they may well need anticoagulation for the next 20 years. If half of our patients are stopping within the first two to three years, why bother in the third, first place? We're not going to have any impact on atrial fibrillation-associated stroke. So patient education becomes critical. I'm not going to go through all aspects of this, but the reality is a very nice article out of um, U United USC, University of Southern California, on how much time do physicians take prescribing new medication. And in this study, the physicians knew they were being observed. 49 seconds. With warfarin, patients get much more than that. And it's been recommended they get more than that. 
If all the patient gets is you have atrial fibrillation, take one pill twice a day, I'll see you in a year, that's not adequate. I'm not going to go through each of these, but what this does, my pharmacist in my own anticoagulation clinic went through, here is the list of areas of education recommended for patients on warfarin. What the pharmacist did then said, well, is this still relevant to dabigatran? Is it relevant to rivaroxaban and apixaban? And as you can see, most of the areas where it's highly relevant for warfarin, it's equally relevant in the other areas. So you don't need as much regular monitoring. You don't need monthly INRs, but you still need ongoing monitoring of kidney function and liver function, even on the new drugs. So the new drugs are not prescribed and forget. They have a bleeding rate that is similar to warfarin, and patients should have similar amounts of education, not 49 seconds. Drug-drug interactions is another, is, oh, no drug interactions. And yet you look and see with these. The problem is there's no lab test to tell you there's a drug-drug interaction. So if a patient takes St. John's wort, it may nullify the benefit of the drug, but you have no lab test to tell you that. If they take what is referred to as a strong inhibitor, strong inhibitors raise the drug levels by at least 400% and increase the risk of bleeding. But the only way for the physician to keep track of this is to memorize these. None of the drug reconciliation systems have them in it. Even in the VA, if I want to order one of the new blood thinners for a patient on Dilantin, I get no warning out of the computer that those are interactive. So these are areas where if you don't have qualified people overseeing the patients, uh, the patients will get into trouble. Again, some additional resources are listed. I'm not going to go through all of those. I just want to emphasize that for those of you in quality improvement, the novel anticoagulants are going to bring new challenges. One of the things will be to talk to the people in your facility. How are we managing these? Who's educating the patients? Who's looking for drug interactions? Where is that being documented? At least one of the companies is out there with an excess of $500 million settlement over bleeding issues. That's one of my ongoing challenges with the pharmaceutical companies. What are you doing to educate patients so that they understand what the risk is? The new drugs are not a magic bullet. They're not a magic pill. It is not just the inherent characteristics of a medication or a molecule that determines the effectiveness of an anticoagulant. It's the molecule combined with an education and a management structure. And if nothing else, if you remember this line at the bottom here, cannot prescribe and forget and expect the same level of results as in the trials. In the trials, every patient on these new drugs was seen once a month. That gets forgotten by the physicians, and they all had great education to have informed consent to baseline. So even with these new agents, they still require almost as much education as warfarin. They still require ongoing follow-up and education. So with that, I will go ahead and stop. Like we say, there's new drugs coming. The ADE issue is going to be the same because bleeding side effects are going to be one of the biggest areas, but how we monitor that from a QA perspective will be an ongoing challenge. I'll turn it back over to Chuck. Great. Well, listen, Alan, thank you so much. There are a number of takeaways, and I can tell you I will, would re, we're going to have a, a polling question regarding a deeper dive on these topics, and I know an, a lot of our audience will need to learn to educate their own teams, and as we move towards managing populations, uh, you know, th this, there's, there's a definite driver and energy to be aware of uh, where the gaps are. So this was terrific. I'm going to move to Nadine Shehab, Dr. Nadine uh, Shehab, our PharmD from the CDC is going to speak, but uh, we'd love to have, we've already had some questions popping up, Alan, so be prepared for a couple questions regarding home monitoring and uh, th those issues. We've had folks, because we get emails during these webinars, and we always want to answer, uh, get as many answers as we can.
Uh, Dr. Shehab is a, a senior scientist with the Medication Safety Program at the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion at CDC. Uh, she provides leadership and surveillance of ADEs using a national public health surveillance system, uh, which I'm sure she'll uh, address. She provides leadership and programmatic support to the CDC uh, program. She's had numerous articles in uh, JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Pediatrics, uh, and acts as a liaison to FDA uh, and a number of other organizations. And rather than take her time by reading her extensive bio, I recommend that you do so. Super qualified, uh, very, very um, uh, grateful to uh, Dr. Shehab for speaking to us. And we'll jump right in with you, Nadine, and then uh, elements of your bio that you think are important, please uh, plug them in. But I recommend our audience, all of our audience look you up. Thanks so much for speaking to us today. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Denham, and uh, certainly for the opportunity to present alongside Dr. Jacobson. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I won't add very much to those kind words that Dr. Denham said, but um, I am a clinical pharmacist by training and epidemiologist with the CDC. Um, I'm joining you this afternoon from Atlanta on a very uh, cold, unusually cold day, but thankfully it's not a snow day for us and I hope not for you as well. Um, I wanted to follow up Dr. Jacobson's excellent presentation um, with an introduction to the National Action Plan for Adverse Drug Event Prevention and to reinforce the importance of the need to optimize anticoagulation management um, to protect patients from a large but what we know is preventable cause of harm. Um, the action plan was developed by way of a coordinated effort throughout the Department of Health and Human Services and other federal agencies such as the Veterans Health Administration, and it addresses federal initiatives targeted at prevention of adverse events or harms resulting from medications, and among them harms resulting from the critical class of drugs, anticoagulants. Um, the CDC had the privilege of leading the work group on anticoagulant adverse events as part of the action plan rollout. And we really appreciate being able to introduce this aspect of the action plan um, to you all, leaders in patient safety and healthcare quality. So um, I've, uh, they don't let me out of the office very much in Atlanta, so I have no financial disclosures to report. And I'll provide a brief overview of the national burden of anticoagulant adverse events, introduce the action plan, um, and discuss key um, recommendations from the action plan. So um, anticoagulants have been used for a very long time, um, were friends specifically for six decades. <laughs> so why the renewed attention and focus on anticoagulation safety and management? Um, when we think of iatrogenic harms, um, for instance, in hospitalized patients, we tend to think of healthcare-associated infections um, and surgical complications, but in fact, it's medications that are the most common causes of inpatient complications. Um, they contribute to increased lengths of stay, and they contribute to increased hospital costs. And unfortunately, anticoagulants are um, a common cause um, of those um, uh, drug-related harms in the hospital. Um, and a nationally representative sample of hospitalized Medicare beneficiaries who um, were um, uh, inpatients in 2008, anticoagulant ADEs um, were the most common um, uh, finding um, in terms of drug-related harms. And of all of the, um, the deaths due to all adverse events in this um, sample of patients that were both related to drugs received in the hospital, but other hospital-related complications, again, such as healthcare-associated infections and surgical complications, it was anticoagulant ADEs that contributed to almost half of those deaths in the hospital. On the outpatient setting, you saw some of these numbers before from Dr. Denham. Um, uh, in patients in the community, um, uh, medication-related harms contribute to 3.5 million office visits, 1 million emergency room visits, and almost 300,000 hospital admissions um, in Americans. And again, um, we find that warfarin is a commonly implicated drug in U.S. ED visits for ADEs. Um, in 2006, in two, between 2006 and 2008, we estimated here at CDC that um, there's approximately 60,000 ED visits for warfarin ADEs annually. Um, this number is probably up to 100,000 now. And these visits to the emergency room for anticoagulant-related ADEs or harms are serious. Um, Two-thirds um, uh, uh, involve acute hemorrhage, such as a G-high hemorrhage. 
Um, one third involve a laboratory abnormality, such as an elevated INR, or it's a patient who's fallen while they're being anticoagulated. Anticoagulated for that reason, they need um, ER follow-up to determine if there's any problems. And 40% of the ED visits for warfarin-related um, um, ADEs um, result in the patient being subsequently hospitalized. Um, the patients who are subsequently hospitalized, um, they can be hospitalized up to seven days, um, and um, the hospitalization costs anywhere from 800 to $1,000. So when you have, you have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of these events every year in Americans, the costs add up. Um, this is um, the study that Dr. Jacobson alluded to before related to outpatient ADEs resulting not only in emergency room visits but then in subsequent um, hospital admission. And again, we've estimated that um, there's approximately 100,000 hospitalizations in older Americans annually for medication-related harms, two-thirds resulting from anticoagulants, insulin, and um, antiplatelets and oral diabetes agents, um, and two-thirds were because of the supra-therapeutic effects of the drugs. So basically, the drugs act in the way that they're supposed to, but in an exaggerated fashion or sort of in an overdose fashion. And um, this finding that few commonly used Older medications like warfarin and insulin are responsible for the majority of ADEs has been noted before. And it's exemplified in a great quotation from Dr. Brian Strom, one of the country's leading drug safety experts. He says, it is well recognized that adverse drug events are the most common iatrogenic causes of patient injury, and that most adverse reactions are the result of an exaggerated but otherwise usual pharmacologic effect of the drug. Yet historically, these reactions, common adverse effects from older drugs that are used incorrectly, have been ignored. Um, in 2011, um, the data about inpatient and outpatient Medicaid-related harms from um, federal agencies like the CDC, ARC, um, who also publishes these types of data, they catalyzed um, a congressional call to the uh, Department of Health and Human Services to convene a joint task force to address these particular agents, and among the issues uh, for these agents, transitions of care, coordination of EHRs, development of prevent preventive measures, and changes to Medicare reimbursement as it relates to um, um, anticoagulants, diabetes agents, and opioids. Um, although the action plan is focused on prevention of medication harm um, and not necessarily under utilization of medications, I cannot overemphasize, and it's really important to keep in mind, that for anticoagulation management practices to be optimized and to protect patients, we must address anticoagulation underutilization and we must address anticoagulation effectiveness. We have um, uh, anecdotal data from the, uh, from the U.S. population that anticoagulants are underused. Um, fewer than one half of patients with atrial fibrillation are, are eligible for, uh, who are eligible for receiving warfarin are not receiving it. And you heard from Dr. Jacobson's presentation what that can mean in terms of the devastating consequences of stroke in, a in AF patients. Um, over 75 patients with venous thromboembolism um, may be non-adherent with warfarin. Uh, what is important to know is that when uh, patients are interviewed about lack of persistence to warfarin or use of warfarin, when, patient, when physicians um, and other providers are um, interviewed about um, why they may not prescribe or why there may be underdosing or hesitancy to dose um, to, the, to the appropriate effect, which again also Dr. Jacobson mentioned is crucial to achieving optimal management, um, they voice concerns about bleeding. Um, and our goal through foc by focusing on, um, uh, on anticoagulant harms and improving the systems around anticoagulation safety and management um, in the action plan or promoting um, those practices is to help advance the field of anticoagulation safety by minimizing these concerns. If these concerns can be minimized, if we can talk to our patients about them, if we can ensure that our quality improvement and patient safety programs address these harms, um, then hopefully that will help advance um, optimal anticoagulation management and get patients who need anticoagulants on anticoagulants. Um, so uh, with um, in 20, as I mentioned, um, the HHS initiative um, on uh, ADE prevention was launched um, given the renewed focus on, um, a on anticoagulant safety and glycemic safety and opioid safety. Um, various federal partners were represented, um, too many to list, um, and it would be a typical sort of government bureaucrat presentation if I, listed, if I mentioned all the acronyms, but here they are. It's sort of a monumental undertaking uh, to get all these folks together, but uh, it, was, it was a great opportunity to coordinate and communicate. Um, we formed our charge was to form uh, departmental public and public-private partnerships to initiate discussions on um, and federal approaches um, to ADEs that were common 
clinically significant, meaning we knew that these types of medication-related harms complicated care or they consumed um, resources. The ADEs um, were measurable by, our, by not just national surveillance systems, the kind that we use at CDC, but we wanted to, um, to focus um, on ADEs that hospitals, clinic providers um, can also measure at their, at their local um, uh, environments. And there had to be some evidence for preventability, and we needed to incorporate those approaches into what became the action plan for um, ADE prevention. Um, so our charge was really to identify targets, catalyze federal agency efforts, catalog, coordinate, and communicate. But what I'd like to emphasize is that the action plan is not about um, we were not recreating clinical guidelines. I've said before, if someone had tasked me to rewrite the chess guidelines, I would cry. <laughs> so that certainly was not um, a, a task. The, the clinical guidelines are out there. Um, we, um, and also Dr. Jacobson hinted at this, um, there, uh, we recognize that specifically for anticoagulants and also for all of the drugs, um, there will be a subset for patients for whom harms specifically bleeding cannot be prevented. Um, that is, there is a risk for the anticoagulants um, that simply cannot be completely eliminated. Uh, but for those patients who could benefit from prevention, we wanted to ensure that federal resources were helping hospitals and clinics be able to um, identify these resources, again, incorporate them into the quality and safety programs. And the action plan um, is not about penalizing clinicians um, as it relates to um, measure reporting and reimbursement. Instead, we really want to help to facilitate the path again for optimal anticoagulation management. Um, so as mentioned before, the action plan targets were anticoagulants, diabetes agents, and opioids uh, based on data for uh, burden of harm and preventability. Um, our work group for anticoagulants specifically convened from December 2012 to June 2013. We were tasked with addressing surveillance, prevention, incentives, and oversight, um, and research. We had participation by approximately 11 federal agencies, and we had um, we were um, very lucky uh, that um, our lead um, non-federal subject matter expert consultant was Dr. Um, Scott Cates, out of, um, the chief quality officer out of Hurley Medical Center in Michigan. We also had input from over 15 other subject matter experts and organizations in academia, hospital care, ambulatory care, long-term care, home care, and the CMS state quality improvement organization. Um, when the draft action plan was put together, we also received public comments from um, uh, cardiology and hematology organizations, geriatrics, hospital associations and affiliates such as the Joint Commission, individual physicians, nurses, pharmacists, industry, patient safety organizations, and pharmacy organizations. And this is all really just to emphasize that although this was a, a federal effort and a focus on cataloging the federal resources targeted at, at um, ADEs, we really did try uh, to do our best to um, do the outreach that was needed to um, sort of get the uh, um, get the reality check that sometimes we need in federal government, admittedly. Um, so I, the um, anticoagulant chapter, I'm very proud to say, is the longest chapter in the action plan. Um, so I, I, and it, it took me a while to go through everything, but what I wanted to present was um, the key recommendations and then try to put those in context for you um, if you're out there working in patient safety and quality improvement. So essentially the, um, the bottom line up front, the bluff, um, the uh, action plan concluded, to minimize population harms from anticoagulants, federal partners will need to, in the area of surveillance, support advancement of surveillance strategies that, uh, that better identify real-world burden and scope of anticoagulant ADEs. That means not only at the federal level are we measuring um, how much harm um, AD, uh, anticoagulant ADEs are causing, but your hospitals, your clinic, also have the tools that they need to be able to measure anticoagulant-related harm and anticoagulant management quality. In the way of prevention, federal partners will need to support development, dissemination, and uptake of optimal anticoagulation mm -hmm. management strategies, especially in under-addressed under settings such as care transitions and long-term care, meaning where we are not doing a good job in utilizing anticoagulation clinics or ensuring that patients are enrolled in warfare in patient self-testing or patient self-management or utilizing our community pharmacists or our nurse run um, anticoagulation clinics um, where there are high-risk patients in long-term care settings or are, or are transitioning from the hospital to nursing home back to hospital. In those areas, we need to ensure that if there aren't guidelines, guidelines be developed. If guidelines are there, are they being used? In the area of incentives and oversight, um, we wanted to support policies, um, including measure um, reporting and electronic health record standards that incentivize optimal anticoagulation management and that minimize payment coverage 
pavement or coverage barriers to such management. In the area of research, um, really it came down to needing to support research of the real world management of the newer oral anticoagulants, which Dr. Jacobson emphasized are not going to be a magic pill. And there will be issues related to drug selection, transitions among these agents, adherence, laboratory testing, and reversal strategies when the patient comes in toxic that will need to be addressed that were not fully addressed in clinical trials. Um, so what does this mean in sort of non-government speak uh, for those who are um, sort of, um, on the ground really doing the, the work in patient safety and, and, and quality? Um, and I'll give you an example from prevention, something that we address in the action plan as it relates to really um, advancing prevention for anticoagulant ADEs. So, uh, we're CDC and um, the world that we know is antibiotics and infections and healthcare associated infections and um, I, we use this as an example. Um, um, in March of last year, the CDC recommended that all U.S. hospitals implement an antibiotic stewardship program that includes at a minimum seven core elements leadership, accountability, drug expertise, tracking, reporting, education, and action. And I think what Dr. Jacobs in their presentation alluded to and emphasizes, these are all components that you need for optimal anticoagulant management to ensure patients aren't harmed from the stroke perspective, from the thromboembolism, from the VTE perspective, or from the bleeding perspective. So can we do this for anticoagulation? Is this something that we can promote within our health systems um, on the inpatient setting? Um, and we have come really close. Um, the Joint Commission, um, we applaud them in the most recent National Patient Safety Goals, um, have added recently a goal that, that hospitals need to evaluate anticoagulation safety practices, take action to improve practices, and measure the effectiveness of those actions. So we would call upon health systems to also sort of do this um, sort of self-evaluation and see what are the practices that we have in place in our health systems to ensure this is happening, um, and to sort of borrow from the field of antibiotic stewardship that is been um, really associated with, redu with reductions in um, antimicrobial resistance, reduction in and I infective cost reduction in healthcare associated infections, how can we borrow from the sort of the multidisciplinary coordinated example of stewardship focused on a very critical class of drugs that we can't get away from not using. We, we want folks to use anticoagulants in patients who are ideal candidates for them, um, but how do we ensure that the systems are there? And is there sort of this systematic, coordinated, targeted, multidisciplinary approach something that could be used? Um, on more on the outpatient side, but also it relates to sort of the transition of care when a patient, for example, is put on a new oral anticoagulant in the hospital um, or in the community. Um, what we really wanted to emphasize is that there are so many issues that um, we, uh, that providers and also federal resources need to address with the new agents. So this isn't, again, as Dr. J said, put your patient on it and forget. Um, there are, there's, there's, you don't have the option of one agent anymore. You may have the option of four or five or six. How do you build, select the best agent for your patient? Um, and how do you do that with a discussion with the patient? How do you transition among um, agents, especially from warfarin to a new drug? Um, uh, I've heard uh, patient stories, patients who tell me, yeah, I just I went and picked up my prescription for, for um, the Vigatran. I was previously on warfarin for how many ever decades. Um, I asked the pharmacist if there's anything I needed to know. You know, they said no. That's, that's not where we want to get to. We want to get to a point where we're using our community pharmacists our MTM programs um, to uh, really uh, help transition patients to the um, to agents to new agents appropriately. Um, what do we do when patients have to have an operation while they're on these agents? We need tools to promote adherence to these agents. Um, patients are non-adherent on warfarin; they'll likely be non-adherent on the new oral anticoagulants. And um, there will probably be laboratory assays coming down the road. Um, providers will need help in interpretation of those laboratory assays, and we will need help in understanding how to manage bleeding events uh, because there's not reversal agents for these drugs as there are for warfarin. And so in that sense, um, there's a potentially very important role that remains for the anticoagulation clinics, these Coumadin clinics that have historically been just Coumadin clinics, but really a role for systematic management, as Dr. Jacobson mentioned. Um, and so really looking at um, your population, whether it be in the community or in the hospital, and saying, okay, what are the safety nets that we have in place that addresses these components of new oral anticoagulation management, um, either by way, uh, by way of um, any tools that you have?
So there's an action plan um, now and so what, basically. We hope as a federal government to progress collaboratively, not only amongst ourselves, but with you, um, the private sector um, stakeholders, um, the physicians, the nurses, the pharmacists, um, the quality and patient safety leaders. We hope that this generates momentum so that there is implementation and uptake of evidence-based evidence policies and practices um, um, at uh, not only the national level, but the local, the hospital and clinic levels. And we hope to eventually be able to evaluate and air impact and that might be our biggest challenge given that the universe of anticoagulation management is changing and, and changing fast. Um, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, all those who make this work possible, um, especially Dr. Michelle Mistry, our fellow, and Dr. Scott Gates for his um, subject matter expertise and leadership. Um, and this, has, uh, this slide has the link uh, to the um, ADE Prevention Action Plan uh, should you want to learn more. Of course, also please free to, feel free to contact us here at CDC. Thank you. Nadine, thank you so much. <clears throat> and I think, you know, I, I, our audience uh, probably reflects my feeling that there's, we, we really need to have a deep dive uh, and really dig into some of these daunting issues as our quality and safety officers are now having to be responsible for populations. Kyle, please start the uh, polling because, you know, if we have people drop off at all during the dialogue, I want to capture some of the uh, some of our polling questions right away. So Kyle, if you could please start the poll, and I'm going to address each of these questions, So, and then we'll come back to you, uh, both of you. Wonderful presentations, a broad uh, to number of topics and critical uh, issues. So the first question is, I am interested in a deep dive on anticoagulation best practices and protocols. That's taking what we've heard today now to a deeper level of the practical implementation. I think that our quality and safety officers and leaders across our system are pretty senior and are starting to understand that they're starting to have to be responsible for these populations and not just acute care but continuity of care and the outpatient environment. And the, this question, if you rank it a 10, very strongly agree, and we see lots of 10s, we will undertake another webinar with a deeper dive to help you all practically get your arms around what you would have to do now to be able to take this area in a, in a, in a deeper fashion uh, uh, with specifics on success stories, implementing protocols, challenges, barriers, etc. The second question is, I'm interested in joining a community of practice on anticoagulation management. We have been, over the last 30 years, starting these and got cross-communication between groups that are, are, are working and trying to adopt these innovations quickly. A community, community of practice would be one that might meet once a month specifically on this topic, share the best practices, share the challenges, share concepts, tools, and resources. And this would be separate from our monthly webinar where we try to cover for you the hottest, most important topics throughout the year. This would be one where periodic web-based meetings and really tackling some of the issues like working with your local pharmacist and how to really tackle this challenge now that we really know so much more about it. The third question is, I need help in developing an ROI business case for anticoagulation programs. Alan, when I come back to you on a couple of quick questions, this was always the biggest challenge is nobody was willing to pay for it. Well, now when we're responsible for populations and now we have to pay for these, uh, these issues, it's a, the total, it's a totally new environment, but we need to be able to show the economics of the damage when we don't put our atrial fib patients on anticoagulation, the 50% the that don't get on, and those that do, why it's important that we practice systematic uh, management. So this would be help in developing a business case, and that could be part of the community of practice, but we want to know, would you like to have the economics so that you could really understand the powerful message that comes through? We've spent a lot of time with Alan on learning this, and I think we could really update this. And then the next question is, my organization has anticoagulation expertise to share with others. And if that's the case, we'd love to hear that and know that because uh, and we'd like to be able to identify you so that uh, we could do that. And so on the free text entry, last question, you could just add that you have expertise there that you'd like to share. Um, and that's the last, in that last question during the topic section, you see with the free text entry, that way we'll know who you are. But the issue, the final, uh, the final uh, question on a scale of 10 is, I'm interested in collaborating 
connecting with my community pharmacist. We understand, and you mentioned that, Nadine, uh, briefly about the MTM, the medication therapy management, and how important we know that the comprehensive medication reviews can be, and they can really connect the doctors who are caring for separate silo activities back together with their community pharmacists. So if you're interested in collaborating and connecting, with your community pharmacist. We got a high number last time. We want to really find out, are you interested in connecting with your own in, in, in this fashion, especially on some of these topics, scale of 1 to 10? And then finally, the topics in anticoagulation management I need help with are, give us your list, and we will address all of them. That's how we build our, our future webinars. So thank you for um, indulging me, our, our speakers, to, uh, to go through these questions. I just want to make sure that we capture the data. Our audience is really good about answering these, and we drive every webinar based on the audience. So um, uh, first, uh, uh, first question uh, to both uh, you, Alan, and Nadine, and then I'd like Frank to comment because this is an area where we've worked on, but we got an email uh, from one of our attendees saying, could you please address the home monitoring devices? You know, how effective are they? Uh, we're not looking for endorsements of a product, but maybe you can rattle off those that are out there and, and uh, address this home monitoring and home measurement, Alan and then Nadine. Um, I'll just make a quick comment. Uh, if you want to know the devices out there, just go to Google, um, put in home INR monitoring, and you'll get a list of the options. Uh, what I will say is it is an option. It's not the be-all, end-all, but it's an option. And what we showed in a 3,000 patient VA study was that appropriately trained and willing patients have outcomes that are as good as or better than professionally staffed anticoagulation clinics. So if you have a willing, able, and reliable patient and you have an infrastructure, there's a lot of options out there. Many of the companies will help with the data management uh, so that an individual office doesn't get swamped. Um, the devices themselves are every bit as reliable as the central lab. Central labs differ somewhat among each other in their results. The devices used for home testing may have some differences, uh, but it is no different than the types of results you get out of a central lab. Needing home monitoring and, and kind of implementing on that on a population management. Uh, any comments there? Sure, yes. So CDC doesn't have any specific recommendations in that regard. And the action plan, um, all, because it was not a clinical guideline, all we could do is sort of echo what the, what the uh, nationally recognized clinical guidelines recommend. And it's essentially what um, it's based on the data that Dr. Jacobson presented. But what we do, what we do say is that if um, there are uh, Evidence, it, is, it is one of the, it's considered home monitoring for patients on warfarin by way of patient self-testing or patient self-management is considered um, a, an evidence-based management strategy that is associated with positive outcomes, including improvement in bleeding outcomes and improvement in stroke outcomes. Um, if whether the patient is enrolled in an anticoagulation clinic or is chosen for as a candidate for PST or PSM is entirely dependent, obviously, on the provider and the patient's choice. But what we do recommend you do from the quality and safety perspective and what we want the federal agencies to do is to ensure that uh, providers do understand that there, that is an option and to, uh, that if there's, there is a patient who is a candidate for that um, and the, the guidelines that exist out there give a good sense of who are ideal patients. Um, they're usually self-directed, so on and so forth. If you, do, if you have an ideal patient population for that, to ensure that they're enrolled in at least one systematic form of management, um, it, it be at home testing or clinic, um, but uh, really base it on, on the patient profile that you have. Great, thank you. Now, Frank, I know as a biomedical engineer, Frank Ito, our chief uh, technology officer, longstanding interest in anti-coag, and we're, we, we worked, as we said, very closely on this design of a systematic approach to, um, to management. Do you have questions of, uh, of Alan or Nadine, Frank, or a comment on this? Uh, no, I, I will monitor? say that it's, um, uh, these were both excellent presentations and, and really, again, emphasizing uh, the need for a systematic approach and while technology is always a, an element that enables it without having uh, that systematic uh, approach, you're likely going to have uh, uh, these failure points. And I, I think from my perspective, and we had done some work on, the, on workflow and looking at how we could optimize the process to make sure the patients uh, would come back in and be uh, appropriately uh, taken care of and 
uh, there would be some kind of payment mechanisms. Uh, have uh, or has any work been done more directly in dealing with a pharmacist? I, I heard Nadine mention the NTM and some of the work in that space that would uh, maybe um, be a, a high touch point because obviously the patient is frequently in the pharmacy to, to do the refills. Uh, and have that opportunity to to really have that uh, high touch of uh, education at that point in time um, in the community environment. Uh, any comments there, Nadine? Or, or I'm going to interrupt you, Frank, real quick. I see that there's an error on our polling, and number six question ended up with a one through ten. The topics in anticoagulation management I need help with are if uh, it, it, uh, that should have been a free text entry. That's an error. My apologies. So just enter your free text entry on the final question. New topics of any area I need help with are if you just combine them there, no problem. We'll be able to sort them out. And, uh, and Kyle, if you could, while we're still having comments, maybe put a slide up with an email address to send the topics that you have interest in in anti-coag since that, that survey question is the wrong formulation. You could email us the areas or topics of interest to you. I don't want to miss that opportunity. So either put them in, in the answer to number seven, or Kyle will put up an email address to have you send any of the areas for which you have uh, great interest in anti-coag and we'll include them in, in, in future work. I can almost guarantee you we're going to do another deep dive on anti-coag. Sorry, Frank. C continue, please. Do you want to recap what your did? Did you have a question, Frank, or comment? Um, yes. Well, Frank, Frank you, yeah, you, you were asking okay. some you were asking some about the pharmacists, and I, I will say um, I have a son who's been going through pharmacy school. It's been interesting observing things, and there are things coming out as to how pharmacy is evolving that is encouraging. Currently, retail pharmacy is a volume business, and that's the reality. And even when there are state laws in place to say every new prescription the patient will be offered, when the patient is offered by a comment of, you don't need us to explain this, do you? The patients will happily decline. And so the current reality is very challenging because there just aren't the incentives there. But as we start seeing more things where what is the role of pharmacies in providing certain aspects of medical care, these are areas that are highly algorithm driven to have standardized education. The pharmacists are the ideal ones to do the drug-drug reconciliations. So I think some of the evolving models of pharmaceutical care, and especially under accountable care organizations may provide opportunities for quality improvement as we keep moving forward. Great. Thank you, Alan. I want to give, uh, um, I, I want to give Dan Ford an opportunity, if you like, uh, Dan, on the topic to respond. We'll come back to you at the very end here in a couple minutes. But uh, Dan, did you, were there any comments regarding the topic that you wanted to cover? And hopefully, hopefully everyone saw Kyle's uh, email address, Kyle. Uh, put that back up. Uh, we've, uh, uh, to leave it on, uh, to email to Kyle any any topics you want us to cover, and specifically on anti-coag. Uh, Dan, comments that you might have, and then Nadine, I'm going to come back to you. I got uh, just a couple of things, and, and my my battery on my phone is saying I got to be recharged. So if I disappear, I apologize. Um, real quickly, I, I'm 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 just. Um, so impressed by the need for the partnership between doctors and patients in terms of communications, transparency, education, and cooperation. Um, it's just uh, it's a matter of life and death. Uh, I'm also thinking we need national guidelines specifically geared toward the partnership between the patient and the family that are developed with the input of the patient and the family. We need the voice of the patient, voices of the patient involved in developing these guidelines. My question is, um, as, a, as a senior citizen, as a veteran and a VA patient, uh, and a senior citizen using Medicare in the private sector, I'm curious as to how the VA compares with the private sector and how we're, how we're handling this uh, uh, particular subject. Yeah, I think the, 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 
Oh, go, uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Alan, and then Nadine. Yeah, the, the VA tends to have a large number of anticoagulation clinics. We still don't have the level of national standardization we would like to see, but because we are fully capitated both for the adverse events as well as the care of the patient, there's definitely a much higher prevalence. Um, over 100 of the VA medical centers have formalized anticoagulation clinics. Nadine, comments? Uh, 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 yes, with respect to the VA here. point, um, uh, in, the, in the National Action Plan, I can um, definitively tell you we borrowed a, uh, a lot from the Veterans Health Administration in terms of guidelines and systems of care um, to address medication-related harms, particularly anticoagulation-related harms, um, uh, which is reflected by Dr. Jacobson's point um, in terms of the VA really historically been the, the pioneer in um, uh, pharmacists and nurse-run clinics and integrating pharmacists into these clinics so that they can um, uh, be um, uh, target, give, deliver targeted management to these patients. And so this, to the extent that the VA has been a pioneer in that model of care um, and has a lot of guidelines um, that um, um, address these harms already, and that they were early on very rec uh, uh, recognized the importance of addressing this, this ADE. We did borrow a lot uh, from that, and we talked about how those examples could be shared. But of course, there's improvements that could be made everywhere, and uh, within the VHA, our, the VHA representatives talked about um, uh, you know federal improvements within that federal system as well. But um, they were truly exemplary. With respect to utilizing pharmacists in the community, in the hospital, um, to to address these ADEs from a quality and patient safety perspective, really it comes down to borrowing from the antimicrobial stir, uh, antibiotic stewardship example. Um, the CDC recommendations for antibiotic stewardship um, recommend that um, there is drug expertise or pharmacist leadership in that, in that multidisciplinary coordinated care. I don't see anticoagulation management in the inpatient setting really being any different, really making sure that along with the physician, there's a nurse, there's a, there's a pharmacist who is um, um, addressing the patients on anticoagulants to see that they're optimally dosed and that um, they're dosed according to, to renal function, to age, um, and they're being transitioned out of the hospital safely with follow-up to primary care. Um, so that multidisciplinary component in terms of sort of a stewardship concept and a, and a pharmacist incorporated into that stewardship concept is critical. Um, the outpatient setting, we do have MTM as a tool, but there's also collaborative practice agreements um, that pharmacists can sign with individual physicians to help manage patients um, um, who are on chronic um, disease medications, um, such as warfarin. In fact, the CDC um, has worked with various pharmacy organizations and other uh, primary care organizations on developing tools um, that pharmacists, nurse, and can use to leverage pharmacists in the in the chronic um, in the collaborative in the CPAs in the collaborative practice agreements and the CDC chronic disease website actually has more information on that for those who are interested. But it could be really used for any medications. Um, but um, this medication this medication class is particularly important, of course. Well, listen, we are right on time. I would like to ask uh, Kyle move uh, to slide 17, if you would, so I can introduce our next topic. But Nadine, uh, I, I know you can't speak out of turn, but is it is it is it a fair statement to say that there are new uh, incentive financial incentives being uh, being considered that could help uh, with the cost of implementing such uh, uh, such the system? And slide 17, Kyle, turn it over to me. Advance advancement to me, and I'll take over. Thanks. There we go. Uh, so, needing incentives, financial incentives for uh, for the population. Uh, but the action plan addressed um, incentives by way of quality reporting and actually more so um, barriers. So there's currently um, coverage barriers as it relates to um, pharmacists delivering um, anticoagulation care, but there's also barriers to individual physicians who are outside of a system like the VA or a big healthcare academic system to delivering, to, to, to in developing basically an anticoagulation clinic model. And to the extent that we think systematic management will continue to be important for new oral anticoagulants, and that's what um, the thought leaders are, are, are basically telling us. Um, there, there's, there's, there's thinking about how to um, try to eliminate um, some of those, or there was, there was thinking in the action plan about the need to address some of those barriers. Okay.
eliminating the barriers that would then allow that to happen. Well, fantastic. Uh, we, we always finish on time, and we are so thankful for everyone uh, staying in there. Uh, I put up the triple threat slide just to address the fact that we've covered anticoagulation, and depending on your polling response, we'll do a deeper dive. I feel strongly we likely will, but I'd like to have that affirmed by the polling. Uh, next month, we're going to cover the opioid uh, use and pain management, uh, so the opioid and pain management uh, area, and then uh, the following month, we'll uh, tackle the diabetic agents. So on behalf of uh, uh, all of us, we thank you for your attention. We thank these great speakers for addressing some very, very critical uh, issues. And if, if Dan is still on, I'd like to have Dan close us uh, with the, the voice of the patient, and then we'll give you your day back. Thank you so much. Uh, Dan, are you still there? I'm still here to switch phones. Um, I would really like to commend uh, Nadine and um, Alan just on absolutely astounding presentations. Very informative. Uh, I suspect a good wake-up call for a lot of people, and I hope uh, the audience uh, participants, and, and we thank each of you for, for participating, will we'll go back to your organizations with some increased passion about this particular subject. Thank you all, and have a great day. Great. So may God bless you all today, and we'll look forward to next month. And if Nadine and Alan, you could stay on just for a minute for a, a process improvement loop so we can do better every time, we appreciate it. Have a great day, all.